Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Melinda Herring, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. I'm so delighted that we are finally having this conversation. Today's uh, conversation is about how to build independent media in Ukraine, and I think it uh, couldn't be more timely. I'm joined by uh, three phenomenal journalists and one great commentator. We have Miroslava Barchuk, who's the host of Ukrainian television channel uh, UA on Sispilna. I have Brian Bonner, who's the former chief editor of the Kiev Post and a great friend of the Atlantic Council. I have Yevgen Hiblovitsky, who's a partner at the Ukrainian consulting firm Promova and a former journalist, and he'll be joining in just a minute. And finally, I have Sevgil Masaeva, who's the chief editor of Ukrainska Pravda and another great friend of the Atlantic Council. So this issue is really, really important. We know that independent media is growing in Ukraine, and that's fabulous. But there's a problem. A majority of Ukrainians don't receive their news from these independent sources. Sources. TV still dominates. So we're here today uh, to talk about the state of media freedom in Ukraine. How quickly is independent media growing? And what's the best way to ensure independent news coverage on major television stations? These are sort of the framing questions we've put together today. But we're also here to talk about what's going on uh, on a very local level. There's been a bunch of, of very alarming things recently. So we brought together uh, some of the best journalists in Kiev to discuss it. I'd like to first go to Miroslava Barchuk. Miroslava, welcome to the Atlantic Council. It's great to have you here. We're really honored that you could make time for us. I'd like to talk to you about what happened to you recently. You're the host of the talk show Countdown on Perishi, an independent state-funded television station. You recently accused the presidential administration of putting pressure on your program and limiting the presence of servant of the people deputies. The presidential office says your show doesn't meet professional standards. What happened? Uh, hello to everyone, and uh, thank you for invitation for this uh, very important talk. Uh, uh, our statement was um, um, about the, the pressure from the presidential office was caused by a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, its uh, representatives, I mean, president's uh, pres presidential office uh, tried to set conditions for the uh, participation of uh, the members of the parliamentary faction of the servants in uh, our talk show. For instance, uh, for instance, uh, they wanted uh, uh, to determine how many members of their faction should be present uh, at the talk show. If we did not comply, they boycotted uh, the air. Uh, secondly, they tried to introduce a stop list practice. In other words, uh, they could name some other politicians uh, that should not be invited to our show in order to get the representatives of the ruling faction. Uh, we considered it uh, a pressure, of course. Uh, the third point uh, um, is that these demands has been had been usually delivered from the presidential office, not from the press service of the political party, but from the presidential office. And uh, in my opinion, it's important. It means that there is no transparent communication uh, with uh, the formal press service. They simply referred us to presidential office and it was the office who voiced the demands to, to our program. And more importantly, the requests were voiced by some informal, uh, so to say, shadow people from the presidential staff. Those were some persons who did not officially work in the office in the presidential office, had no official position, but actually oversaw the speakers to, to be delegated to the TV channels, our channel and other channels. And fourth, uh, we faced, after all, uh, we faced a real campaign in social media for discrediting our program and uh, the national public broadcaster in general. It was uh, an information wave, which, include, uh, which included bloggers know as to be close or loyal to the presidential office. Uh, some member of uh, parliament from the Mono majority, um, and even such figures as the Minister of Culture, Kachenko. 
the presidential office accused Suspilne, I mean, um, national public broadcaster, uh, that um, our program uh, of, uh, and our, uh, they accused Suspilne and our program, uh, right, for working uh, in the interest of political uh, opposition. Uh, however, in my opinion, uh, there is only way to ensure the balance you need to come and to present your, your position, your stance, not by court, the broadcast. Um, all of this uh, makes me think uh, that the authorities um, try to pressure uh, and control uh, Suspilne. Um, and, uh, all, uh, all, uh, all national public broadcaster. Uh, so this is my opinion and uh, my colleagues' opinion. Great, thank you, Miroslava. Uh, in that statement that you made, uh, you argue that MPs have a duty to the people of Ukraine to explain their views. Could you could you please elaborate your argument there? Look, my point is simple. Ukrainian parliament members take an oath neither to the president nor to the presidential office. They take an oath to the Ukrainian people. They should be responsible participants of the political process. They must explain their position to their voters. They must to do that. Uh, on the air of the independent media and on the air uh, of the national public broadcaster. This is my opinion. Uh, in our case, the press service of the servants and the presidential office uh, have turned from the bodies aimed to facilitate communications with the journalists uh, into the uh, uh, controlling and stop list body. I think this is not right, it's very dangerous. On other hand, it's obvious that the members of parliament are free to choose any TV channel or any show, I understand that. However, uh, my point is different. Uh, in the parliamentary democracy, the presidential office can dictate to the people's deputies uh, and decide for them, uh, nor does it have the right to impose any kind of stop lists telling journalists or telling TV companies who to invite or do not. Uh, it's it's uh, it's very it's very dangerous too. In general, this conflict uh, um, has shown that the current authorities, uh, in particular President Zelensky, uh, do not understand the importance uh, uh, and and missions and mission of independent public broadcasting. Uh, neither uh, the president nor the uh, Ukrainian prime minister. Uh, has ever been to Suspirne. Uh, further to that, uh, President Zelensky has called the national public broadcaster a state television, a state television. Uh, for me, this is a signal that the President Zelensky has not yet understood the difference between uh, state television and public broadcasting. Uh, when, when he says, uh, uh, not once, but twice, or maybe three times, how can the state put pressure on the state television? I realize that he thinks uh, in the totalitarian paradigm of controlling state, uh, controlled, yeah, controlled state uh, television. It looks like in his uh, picture of the world, there is some kind of state television that serves the interest of government. And uh, uh, it does not even need to be controlled by the state since it is already subordinated, subordinated and controlled to the state. And uh, I think it's not, it's not right. Thanks a lot, Miroslava. Uh, just to be clear, uh, and, and uh, we did invite the presidential administration to, to uh, speak on this panel and respond, uh, and they chose not to participate. So I uh, just want to let everyone know that, that uh, we, we, we uh, did make that invitation. Uh, I'd like not to turn surprising to- for me at all. I'm sorry? I'm not surprised by that, that they did not, uh, they did not join us. Uh, it, it, let me ask you one more question, then I want to turn to, to Brian. Um, Miroslava, how, how did you work this situation out? Are things okay now? Are, are servants, deputies um, on your show? What was the, the way out of the, the, this controversy? Uh, 
Yeah, everything is okay. It's much better now. They do not uh, they do not uh, boycott our show. Everything looks okay uh, for now, um, uh, and we'll see uh, in the future how it will work. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Brian Bonner, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, you were the editor of, of the fabulous Kiev Post for many, many years. Uh, and something crazy happened earlier this month. The, the Kiev Post was shut down unexpectedly after 26 years of operation. Uh, to say that we were shocked is an understatement. What happened and uh, was the closure a result of pressure from the owner? And was there any kind of uh, censorship involved uh, in this decision from on high? Well, uh, what happened is shortly is that I think he, Adnan Kivan, decided that this was not a good environment to have to own an independent media outlet, uh, that we were more trouble than we were worth to him and in a lot of ways. And uh, the abruptness of our uh, uh, shutting down surprised me because uh, we've had problems before and he had talked about selling it, but I didn't expect him to shut it down completely. And listen, everybody's looking for a smoking gun like somebody told him this and you know they deny it. He de nobody's going to admit that there was pressure to shut it down. Uh, nobody's going to tell me that. I suspect there was. I know that he had grown tired of all the complaints uh, from authorities and other officials and oligarchs and everyone that we've angered over the years. And you know it wasn't all rocky. We've had some good times, but basically, I think that was a cumulative. Um, burden for him that he no longer wanted to take. Thanks, Brian. Tell us what happened af after it was closed. Uh, what happened to your remnant journalists? Uh, and uh, what do you expect? Are they turning out a new product? And what do you think that the old Kiev Post, there is a, a small group of people who are trying to restart that as well. What Do you think that they'll have the same kind of editorial line that you had before? Uh, well, the old key post, uh, no, I don't think it's going to be the same key post. Uh, I believe that the public backlash to closing down the key post prompted Kivan, who wanted to reassess the paper, to reopen it sooner than he anticipated. I don't think it's going to be uh, editorially independent. It'll be something different. Luke Cheney, who was a former CEO of the key post, has a different view. He's not from journalism background. So I don't think it's gonna be what we are, what we have been, what we're known to be for 26 years, including 14 years where I was the leader. Uh, and that's sad, but the spirit of the Key Post lives on. The uh, entire former team, the entire journalistic team is starting the Key Independent uh, and they're doing well. And they're really, really trying to figure out the puzzle of how to, uh, get the money that's needed to provide independent journalism that's free from pressure from authorities and free from uh, you know, pressure from owners. And I wish them luck and I support them. Super. Uh, Brian, I, I think that a lot of people, we were talking about this a minute ago, have suggested that the presidential office doesn't like the Kiev Post's independent coverage. Andre Bogdan, the former uh, presidential chief of staff, uh, did an interview with you guys and said that explicitly. And uh, we've seen a number of independent outlets complain about pressure. Was that an issue at the Kiev Post? Was it ongoing or, or uh, was it something that was just sort of the, um, how did that work at the Kiev Post when you were the editor? Well, it was always there and it was always underlying. I think we've angered everybody, presidents, prime ministers, oligarchs, uh, CEOs, members of parliament, all, all throughout our history. And some of them told me about this directly and others have this custom of going to the owners and you know, uh, the authorities don't believe in independent journalism. They believe that if, if, if an outlet is a problem, you go straight to who owns it or who controls the source and stop the problem. I mean, that's, that's one of the issues that we had. Fundamentally though, I mean, this is, you know, while it's more welcoming Ukraine to independent journalism and freedom than our, some, a lot of our neighbors, it's still hostile because basically the thing, uh, many of the things haven't changed. 
in 25 years. And that's corruption on high, impunity. And these messages, uh, you know, the scrutiny of officials, the scrutiny of their actions, the lack of rule of law, the problems that investors were having, on and on and on. And these messages, the, the key posts were delivering to the Western community. And I think a lot of people in, in uh, power got tired of it. I mean, it, but I say it's like the murder on the Orient Express. I mean, trying to identify one person who wanted us dead is, is gonna be very, very difficult. That's great. That's very well put. Uh, last question for you. What does the story of the Kiev Post, you were the boss for 14 years there, uh, say about the difficulty of sustaining independent media in Ukraine? Oh, it's first of all, the authorities have to change the attitude. And we know that they don't like investigations and, uh, uh, you know, uh, scrutiny that interferes with their some of their interests. Uh, so, but that's not the only thing. I mean, we have oligarch dominated media and try as we might, I mean, we were not financially uh, profitable. We were unprofitable since the year, last year was 2008. We tried, we tried, we tried. Print advertising, print subscriptions, digital advertising, digital subscriptions, events, everything that we could think of, grants, everything possible. And we still weren't able to turn a profit. So we had to be dependent on the owners. And I don't know of a single uh, news media outlet that is both commercially and editorially independent. It's a rare breed in, in uh, Ukraine. We gave it a shot. We gave it a great run for 26 years. And I believe that the void that uh, our closure uh, will create opportunities, but I think people have to support that. If they really want independent journalism, the community has to support it. Readers, advertisers, uh, everything so that they could insulate our coverage. I mean, I think owning an independent media outlet in Ukraine is very, very difficult. I mean, the ideal owner, given the pressures that exist from outside and from authorities is someone who is rich, non-interfering, doesn't live in Ukraine, doesn't have any friends in Ukraine, no family, no investments in Ukraine, has no pressure points, points from which he or she could be pressured. I don't know such a person, but if you know such a person, have them call me, please. Brian, thank you for your service. The Kiev Post was uh, our best friend and we loved working with you. And it's uh, you are the Dean of English Language Journalism uh, in Ukraine and your legacy will live on. So I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what, where you'll end up next after you have a break. But th thank you thank you for all that you did uh, in Ukraine. Belinda, thanks, but things can change very quickly in Ukraine. I mean, we That's had true. an impetuous owner and we already see, uh, you know, new and promising things with NV announcing English language. So I think it's it's still a dynamic media environment. Okay, that's a great point. Uh, Sivko, let, let's have you come in here. Your newspaper, here? Pravda, was recently acquired by a wealthy businessman uh, who is not from Ukraine. So that meets one of Brian's criteria, but he believes in the rule of law and democracy. He owns uh, another free media in Ukraine. How's it going with your new owner? Uh, and is this the path forward for independent print media in, in Ukraine? Uh, thank you, Melinda. Um, yes, it's true. Uh, so. Uh, first of all, maybe um, uh, here I need to put uh, some history of uh, Ukraine's Kapelda background that it was founded in 2000 by two uh, Ukrainian journalists. Uh, then, unfortunately, Georgi Gugadze was killed uh, after six months. Uh, this media was launched, but uh, we should here understand that uh, Ukrainska Pravda had a huge print on uh, development of inde independent uh, media. And uh, for the last uh, 20, 20 years, uh, it was a, the main discussion, uh, discussion and news platform in the country. Uh, also, um, it was uh, the main source of information uh, during uh, Orange Revolution, during the Revolution of Dignity, and um, uh, also we covered a lot of uh, important uh, investigations about, for example, uh, Paul Manafort, when Yanukovych left country, and uh, uh, you know that uh, when, for example, Yanukovych escaped uh, country, 
Ukrainska Pravda, Ukrainska Pravda audience was compared to uh, one of uh, such uh, medias, for example, New York Times. And uh, here we should understand when you have new heights, you also uh, will have a new challenges. And for us, it was important uh, question here. And uh, when uh, actually uh, Pavel Shermet was alive, he told that uh, Ukrainska Pravda, it was a uh, pizza editorial. So uh, when you could uh, share it this equally, Monk of few employees. Uh, but at the same time, you have this big audience, around 1 million readers. And uh, here I want to mention when, when Georgi and Elena just started Ukrainska Pravda, uh, her audience was around 50 to 12 uh, people uh, per day. Now we have around 1 million uh, readers. And uh, if we compare with 2000, we had five employees. And now we have uh, uh, five different projects and around uh, 70 employees. So it's uh, uh, very hard, and we start. Uh, we uh, we became um, kind of totally independent financially only in two thousand five, uh, when uh, after revolution of uh, after first revolution, uh, orange revolution, uh, because people were uh, afraid even to put uh, some money and to buy uh, to buy advertising here in Ukraine's capital. Uh, and uh, I truly I uh, understand um, here this is the decision of Elena Pretula uh, because if you want to grow and if you want to be um, uh, with a new um, with new challenges of media market in Ukraine with uh, development of uh, media landscape you will need to have more um, uh, money and um, what what actually helped us uh, new owner or uh, dragon capital and they have uh, this experience uh, with a different media you know that uh, they own for example uh, Nova Vreme uh, magazine and they know how media market uh, works uh, so it was a financial decision it wasn't kind of uh, because I, I faced with uh, kind of dirty media uh, things uh, when I was a uh, Forbes reporter and uh, it was unclear. Um, and so, for example, when uh, Kurchenko was a new owner, uh, he bought uh, Forbes and do your match holding in 2017. Uh, and compared to that, of course, it was absolutely uh, right and clear uh, decision. Uh, um, and we published all news. Uh, what uh, we did, uh, first of all, we signed an agreement with a uh, new owner. Uh, before two years or three years before, we published principles and rules of Prince Pravda in our website. And it also was our kind of Bible of independent journalism in Ukraine. And then um, with uh, these documents, with principles and uh, rules of Ukrainska Pravda, and also I uh, read around uh, 20 different editorial rules and editorial agreement with a new owner. Uh, we declared a uh, new agreement uh, between uh, our media and between our owner. We signed this agreement, we published uh, this agreement uh, on May 28th, and on May 26th, sorry. Uh, and uh, everyone um, uh, has an access to this uh, document. Uh, so, so nothing, you, yeah. yeah. Do you have an ombud, ombudsman or someone within uh, your newspaper to make sure that those uh, standards are enforced? How do you enforce th those independent standards? Yeah, actually, I have a big dream to have uh, our new ombudsman. Uh, we will launch a new um, kind of uh, board, independent board, uh, and, peop and people, members of this editorial board, not editorial, independent board, uh, will follow and uh, will tell us if something will uh, go wrong with uh, uh, these rules, with uh, signing this agreement. Uh, now, but you know that uh, it's only six months, uh, and we're now in very uh, slow transformation period, but nothing has changed. Uh, only accept, accept that uh, 
we received a lot of uh, comments and a lot of kind of rumors who was our owner before. And now we kind of Tomasz Fiala media and uh, all our uh, people, I mean, um, um, now when we, for example, um, published an article about David Rahamia or about uh, Andy Yermak, uh, what they uh, think, thought about, what they think about that, that it was kind of direct order of Tomasz Fiala uh, and uh, it's kind of accusations for our editorial board. So maybe it was Fiala uh, direct order to do this investigation or to investigate this guy. Um, unfortunately, we have this philosophy um, at the hands of our people from offic officials that uh, journalists absolutely totally dependent from their owners. And I think that the it's the main problem. If you uh, investigated something, okay, uh, how you can how you can do uh, how you can um, control that. You can control the owner. What actually happened, unfortunately, with Kiev Post and uh, we faced before with uh, different uh, situation in past, I mean, uh, with the image holding, when they first published an article about Kurchenka, what they did. They came to Boris Loshkin, who was owner of OMH holding, and said, okay, guy, uh, 400 million euros and uh, please uh, <laughs> give up. <laughs> so. Um, Unfortunately, uh, and I think that the main problem is that we have 85% of media market uh, owned by oligarchs and we you know, only just need to accept that situation maybe, maybe because uh, it happened 20 or 25 years before. <laughs> Yeah, th th that's a good point. Thanks so much, Sevgil. Uh, Yevgen, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like you to tie all of these uh, strands together. Help us um, understand what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, Miroslava uh, reported a, a problem on her show on October 19. On October 20, representatives from the Savik Schuster a show in Priyami publicly complained about pressure from the presidential administration. The owner of Nash TV says that the presidential administration is demanding that he sell his station. Uh, and then we had uh, what happened to, to the Kiev Post after that. Is what happened to Miroslava part of a larger trend of interference in independent media? Uh, I, I believe indeed it is. Uh, the problem is that the uh, new independent institutions are still weak and uh, there's a mounting political pressure on behalf of uh, Zelensky and his administration to try and get his uh, slice of the media pie before the upcoming presidential elections. Uh, so basically what we see is big um, uh, increase in tensions on, on, the, on the media market. Uh, it was relatively easy for uh, Zelensky and his team to uh, say that uh, you know media is not that important when his ratings were in the 60s and 70s. It's uh, rather uh, becoming important for him to have uh, to be to basically to have media insurance um, uh, when his ratings are vulnerable. And uh, the problem with the commercial side of the media is that uh, seldom media in Ukraine are part of the subscription and advertisement um, uh, market. Most of the media, big media, are part of the political corruption um, uh, market, and uh, return on investment is much better in political corruption than than in um, um, advertisement and subscription. And um, for that reason, uh, also some well-intended owners are buying the media not because they seek profit, but because they seek additional insurance. They are basically raising the stakes. Uh, for whoever would potentially attack them. And um, this is one of the reasons why uh, independence of the public broadcaster is so important because public broadcaster is slowly doing its work. It's establishing, it's developing the standards, it's establishing the standards, it's proliferating the standards. And uh, it's helping the uh, entire market uh, become more mature, uh, more people, more professionals understand um, uh, who they are, what they do, what their mission is. And as we see um, on the case of um, Kiev Post, which is uh, definitely a sad case, but at the same time, 
I would like to applaud the, the team. Uh, you know, it's been several days since the publication was shut down and uh, the team has announced that they are ready to, to, to continue, re ready to, to work on. And, you know, this shows that they have um, enough competence. They, you know, they've been strategizing these days. They've been working hard on, on developing their new publication on, you know, coming up with plans. Um, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that would not be that easy. There were very few people who actually uh, had at the same time, at the same time, um, uh, a competence of a journalist and competence of someone who can run a publication. Uh, so, you know, the situation in Ukraine is not all that gloomy. I really uh, agree with Brian here, who said that, you know, there it's, it's still a very lively environment and, and there's a lot of hope but it's not an easy one either you know the risks are high and we really have to be vigilant because uh, every um, small crisis can actually have significant consequences so so we really have to be vigilant about corporate governance about uh, attacks on freedom of speech about um, uh, uh, making sure that uh, the um, uh, any decisions of the government on media are just and are part of the legal uh, system of decision making, not just the, the the use of brute force. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I wanted to do this event, though, to, to uh, take an even bigger picture of uh, of media in Ukraine. We know that the top 10 most popular television stations are owned by oligarchs and television plays an enormous role, as you just said, in politics. It destroys careers and it makes people. Uh, one question that I think a lot of donors struggle with, Yevgen, is how can reform-minded people in Ukraine and Western donors compete uh, with, with this oligarchic television, given the, the enormous budgets behind those top 10 stations? Does it make sense to put money in packages? Does it make sense to start an independent station? Uh, or, or is there a, a different way to compete? What's your view on that? Well, I think uh, one thing is by being smart and being ahead of uh, competition. It, when you look at the political logic, it's actually quite reactive and quite old fashioned. Uh, the, um, uh, the way the Ukrainian government has been treating the media uh, market was not innovative and was not creative. If we look at uh, the Russian government's attempts to um, uh, silence the independent media. They were much more creative, much more, um, uh, uh, I would say, proactive in, in, in coming up with new ideas and implementing them. Uh, the Ukrainian government has been usually the mammoth uh, that was uh, slowly but steadily trying to, to, to uh, build its way uh, around, uh, around independent media. Uh, I think it's important that the international donors, and I think that it is important that the Ukrainians themselves in the market remain uh, proactive and remain very, um, uh, I would say, retain high maneuverability, ability to come being, you know, uh, entrepreneurial and resourceful and uh, being able to come up with new ideas. Basically, basically innovations, uh, all the innovations that we've seen are innovations on the side of these um, uh, pro-democracy, pro-reformist um, uh, forces. I would say that uh, we have some probably very talented political strategists uh, um, uh, in the political cycles, but they have not been able to create institutions. And, uh, you know, let me stress this, uh, the sustainability of change is about institutions. It's not about who wins the particular campaign. It's about institution, in, institutions and being able to institutionalize the change. This is why um, the uh, uh, rule of law is so important. This is why uh, public service broadcast is so important. This is why self-regulation is so important. Thanks a lot, Yipkin. If you're just joining us, we have three phenomenal journalists and one great commentator to talk about how to build independent media in Ukraine. We have representatives from the former Kiev Post, from Ukrainska Pravda, and from Sispilna. And then we have Yevgen Mihivlovitsky, a former journalist and a, uh, an expert on the media environment in Ukraine. We'd love to have your questions. Go ahead and put them in the chat or put them on Twitter. Okay, this is the fun part. Get ready, ladies and gentlemen. I've got a bunch of questions for you. First one is for uh, Mr. Brian Bonner. This is from Ed Chow at CSIS. He says, is oligarch controlled but competitive media market better than having state controlled media in Ukraine? 
neither are good. But, you know, so let's pick another one. I know Ed, Ed well. I mean, we were trying to get the sweet spot of independent media and commercially and editorially. And uh, with the closing of the key post, that got that shrank even smaller. And why oligarch media is bad because, well, I think we all know that there's no editorial independence there. They're protecting their, their financial interests and state controlled media, as we found. I mean, the Kiev Independent new, Newsletter today reported that Dome TV, which is state funded TV aimed at the Donbass, has been told to have pro Zelensky coverage, to not mention Poroshenko much, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, other, other forms of control. So it really, you know, it goes back to, uh, I mean, neither of them is good. And this, uh, there's absolutely, you know, as Yevgen said, there's no respect for uh, independent media. And uh, there's still this desire from authorities to teach us a lesson for what we do. Thanks, Brian. Do you have any thoughts on how to change that mentality? Me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I still think commercially independent media is the way to go. It's difficult in a country with a GDP of 180 billion or less. It's difficult in a country with no functioning, uh, you know, rule of law institutions. It's difficult in a country that investors are bypassing uh, by and large. And so what do we have? We have a very anemic advertising market. We have oligarchs willing to outspend uh, everybody. Yeah. Uh, in the media market. Uh, and so we, and we still have a culture and we, I'm very proud of our paywall. We, I, I wanted to, I mean, I think people have to pay for the news. That's the most honest and, 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 uh, and, and clean way of getting your support, getting support from the readers. People didn't like it. Uh, uh, Kivan didn't like it. So the first thing they did in the new key post is destroy the paywall so that there was absolutely no, no charging. So it, the business models like that only makes, I wanted to make us less financially dependent on our owners, not more. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, it, Miroslava Barchuk, question for you. Um, a week ago, you and some other Ukrainian journalists started a media movement called Media Rook, aimed at protecting press freedom in Ukraine. Uh, can you tell us more about this? What are the goals of Media Rook and uh, who else is involved? And I think you're muted, Miroslava. I'm mute. Oh, is it okay now? Okay. Uh, I share Yevhen Libovitsky's optimism about um, about the future of Ukrainian me media and the, that the, there is lots of hope. But I also um, uh, see, I, I can see very dangerous signs uh, um, uh, in our um, uh, profession and uh, society and uh, among uh, uh, political, uh, uh, among our politicians. Uh, uh, we had uh, our Dignity and Freedom Day uh, uh, before yesterday, several days ago. And uh, Mr. Arahamia, the chair of uh, the Servants uh, of People uh, faction, wrote a post where he made a very specific point. He said that uh, democracy and freedom, uh, he, he meant that democracy and freedom of speech should end where the uh, destruction of statehood begins. Uh, I wonder who is to determine uh, the end and to verify uh, the signs of the destruction of statehood. Uh, that, that's what I mean uh, when, I, uh, when I tell that uh, uh, there is uh, a serious uh, danger uh, for, uh, for the uh, freedom of speech. So several uh, conflicts uh, between, uh, between the um, official authorities and the media uh, in Ukraine have shown uh, that uh, independence journalists uh, need to unite. To, to defend uh, freedom of speech and independent journalism at all. Uh, and uh, a week ago, maybe a week or a little bit more, maybe two weeks ago, we called our colleagues to get, to get together within the all Ukrainian professional community, which is Media Ruch. Ruch in Ukrainian means uh, uh, movement. Uh, and uh, uh, appealing to our colleagues, uh, we said that uh, uh, now, uh, 
several years uh, after the revolution of dignity that we had, uh, the independence of uh, uh, Ukrainian journalism has uh, has been under under real threat. Uh, Pressure, pressure from authorities, pressure from uh, the owner, oligarchs, uh, all of this uh, undermines uh, our profession and its um, our professional standards. So we appeal to those journalists uh, who remain honest despite the uh, circumstances and uh, those who are uh, guided by standards not the instructions, uh, uh, not uh, the instructions of the government or uh, of the owner. And uh, uh, in order not to be alone uh, in the face of this, of uh, the threat, uh, we gather together. We intend to establish uh, an efficient self-governing organization of, uh, uh, of journalists uh, that can resist the system of uh, uh, political and commercial pressure uh, on freedom of speech. Uh, and uh, uh, tomorrow we'll meet uh, uh, on Hrishatek in the, the downtown of Kiev, and we uh, create a community that uh, unites uh, all Ukrainian uh, journal independent journalists. Wonderful, Miroslava. We wish you luck, and I would definitely recommend you. Uh, that you translate anything you, you put out in, uh, in English as well and share it with the embassies so they know what's going on. Um, another question uh, from Ed Chow, this one is for Sevgil. Uh, he says uh, he misses your English language version <laughs> of Ukrainska Pravda. And he says, please, uh, will you get back to it? And would you accept Western government financial support for the cost of translation? Uh, yeah, I receive this question uh, every time in the guests. So uh, during our meetings with uh, people from diaspora and from Western people, so I think that <laughs> uh, we should do that. And uh, I, I, after, of course, after uh, launching this new Kiev Independent and Nova uh, Vrena, English version will be difficult, but uh, we will try. And we discussed it already, and I hope that. Oh, um, it will happen and for sure we uh, we will happy to uh, receive support from uh, financial donor i mean from foreign foreign donor great so great it, it's it's really hard to um emphasize how difficult it is to follow ukraine um outside of ukraine um, absolutely without yeah. the kiev post without english language publications so um as much as you can do we encourage you to get back to it uh, i got a question from anders oslin and i'm not sure who wants this one but go ahead and just jump in um he was, says when medvedchuk was chief of staff of the president he ran media control personally with weekly uh tim Nikki. can someone say how it is run today and by whom And there's silence. <laughs> Yevgen, do you, do you know this, or are you willing to take this, or Sevgil? It's 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 a more it's a more sophisticated system now. It's not uh, as, as straightforward. I'd rather say it's uh, a system of influence rather a system of control. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there's still strings that can be pulled with uh, different owners, and this is what Brian has been uh, talking about, you know, that basically pol politicians are trying to uh, uh, approach the owners and are uh, trying to pressure them to get the favorable coverage. Um, you know, with regard to um, public service broadcast, for instance, it's a constant uh, uh, play of uh, budget cuts. You know, the public service broadcaster has been having uh, problems with uh, receiving full funding since the day it started. And it has never received 100% of what it was supposed to receive um, annually, uh, according to Ukraine's uh, obligations before the Council of Europe. So, uh, and its own law. So basically there is a number of ways how media can be pressured. And then it's a matter of uh, the strength of the spine inside of these media. Um, and sometimes what we see, the, 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 the differences become so uh, unresolvable that the publications have to be shut down. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Lillian Posner wants to know about the role that grassroots media like Telegram and other social media and messaging apps play uh, in Ukraine. She points out that they've played a major role in Belarus. Uh, how, what kind of role are they playing uh, in, in Ukraine? I think that's a good question, either for Sevilla or Miroslava. Yes, it's true. Uh, uh, we have this uh, very big problem with anonymous uh, Telegram channels. Unfortunately, uh, our politicians uh, use media, use social media as a tool. And during, uh, for example, Poroshenko presidency, it was Facebook uh, and maybe Twitter. And during Zelensky presidency, uh, Telegram channels. And we have uh, thousands of these anonymous channels and uh, politicians, uh, I mean, Office of Presidents and uh, opposition uh, use these channels uh, to spread uh, fake news, to spread uh, political, uh, uh, political manipulations and for, for example, uh, polytechnological also things. For example, uh, you know, the situation with uh, when Goncharuk was fired, firstly, uh, first uh, first his video, uh, I'm not only vi even video, it was audio, uh, audio with his conversation uh, among uh, different uh, people from uh, his um, cabinet of ministers. Um, we were discussing about Zelensky, etc. And uh, a Telegram channel spread this information and uh, 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 and uh, in the end, well, what we saw, uh, he was fired, uh, and it was a big scandal. Um, a lot of uh, fake news. So I think that it's it's a real a real problem, and uh, we need to do something with that. And uh, my proposition uh, is to think about maybe some law with uh, Telegram channels situation. Maybe uh, Miroslava will. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, and also, and also they use uh, uh, anonymous uh, telegram channels to kill the reputation of uh, independence, uh, um, uh, independent uh, media or independent uh, uh, journalists. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, uh, it's very effective too. That's, uh, that, that's what we faced uh, in our conflict with, uh, with the presidential office. So that's the huge problem. I agree. Thanks a lot. Uh, Brian or Yevgen, any, anything else on Telegram or social media? No. Okay, great. Uh, Robert Brinkley, our friend from London, says he makes a good point. He says, if the Western community wants to understand Ukraine better, surely more of our experts should learn Ukrainian rather than expecting Ukrainian media to produce English language versions. I think we all agree with that. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to need a reliable English language publication. Yevgen, did you want to say anything? Uh, I just, I can second that. Yes, yeah, second. There we go. Okay, easy. Um, another another question. Outside of Kiev Independent and Nova Vremya, what other online English language media outlets would you recommend, whether through websites, Twitter feeds, podcasts, Telegram, so that the West can keep up to date on current events in Ukraine via independent media? Let's see. Brian, do you have, do you have any uh, any other websites that are go to websites or blogs? Oh uh, well, I mean, there's not much choice, but there are several. There's Ukraine World is out there in English. Uh, several business uh, newsletters daily. You know, one by Jim Brook, another Ukraine Business News, Concord Capital, Dragon. So uh, the wire services do cover, but usually not from here or, or not from Ukraine, which is a real disadvantage uh and but or some of them have small staffs rferl of course uh radio for europe radio liberty so there are voices out there and that's that's a good thing it's just that we were different because we were like we were mainly ukrainian okay i the american was the chief editor and we had a few expats but that's mainly because we had to have na native quality english but really the depth of our understanding and the uh, of what was happening in Ukraine came from the Ukrainian staff. Absolutely, and you have the Atlantic Council's Ukraine Alert Service too. So that, that, how that. how can I forget that, Melinda? We posted at least one thousand thousands of <laughs> op eds from you and and uh, that you edited and Peter now. That's true. That's true. Okay, I, I've got another great question. This is from Anatoly. He says this is one's a slightly different. What are your opinions on? Um, 
leading counter disinformation in Ukraine? Should it be done through independent media, through the state? He says the counter disinformation center, a civil society organization or something else. Who wants to take that question? Mr. Hiblovitsky. And you're muted. Yeah, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sure. There's a question ab about countering disinformation. And the, the question is, should it come from independent media? Should the state be in charge of it or a civil society organization? What's the best way to counter uh, Russian disinformation? Well, I think uh, there is not a single way that can, uh, you know, it, there is no one solution that fits all, you know, uh, it's it's a number of efforts that have to be done both in education, in uh, uh, civil society, in uh, government actions, you know, uh, banning some of the uh, principal uh, propaganda channels from Russia has been a blessing uh, in Ukraine comparing, you know, we can we can compare Ukraine to other countries where Russian media uh, have access to the audience and they keep on uh, pouring poison uh, onto people. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, countering uh, propaganda is much easier when you have a situation when media don't have to compete with uh, propaganda outlets uh, that uh, camouflage themselves as media. And, um, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, uh, it, this is not the case with uh, uh, social networks. You know, social networks themselves are basically not the level playing field and uh, they do not allow media to uh, get the content to the audience. They basically are selectively approaching the um, uh, dissemination of uh, uh, content, uh, you know, the uh, editorial um, side never knows uh, how the algorithms will be working, and um, you know, and also the other thing is that the, basically the social networks dictate the um, financial side of the of the uh, subscription, and basically um, uh, we're we see that we have these generations in. Uh, uh, social networks. We have the Facebook generation, then we have the Instagram generation, then we have the TikTok generation. But each of these uh, networks has uh, their owners, and these owners are or are not um, uh, open to criticism. Uh, they uh, have their own political preferences. They have their own uh, ways of giving in to or not giving in to the government uh, wishes. Uh, we can see that, for instance, there is. Uh, uh, TikTok keeps any uh, anti-government uh, content out of the Russian segment of TikTok. And um, in, in that sense, um, uh, I'm afraid that social networks will be the other big uh, propaganda players and the other big threat that we will have to worry about. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Miroslava Barchuk, this is a, a, a different question. Uh, is there a supply problem? So we've talked about there's uh, there's the media in Ukraine, which is large, and then the independent media is much, much smaller. Are the universities in Ukraine training enough independent minded people to work in independent journalism in Ukraine? Yes, in my opinion, uh, in my opinion, uh, um, there are there are several uh, universities in Ukraine, for example, Kiev Mohila Academy or Ostrovska Academy. Uh, they or uh, Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, uh, uh, and I uh, I trust uh, um, uh, students and people and professionals uh, uh, who graduated these uh, universities. Um, personally, I do not believe I do not believe in uh, um, in journalism as a profession that they that could be. Uh, that they could be um, that they could uh, so you you can't uh, you can't be uh, you can only be journalists uh, who uh, who uh, try to uh, who, who try to I don't know how to say it in English uh, you can't you can teach someone to to write or to be independent or to to be uh, uh, to be uh, um, they're good uh, in uh, in the profession. 
uh, but uh, you you can you can uh, teach uh, you can teach people uh, or a student uh, uh, to be um, independent think independent thinkers. Yeah. Uh, so I think that we have several universities uh, who, uh, uh, who 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 teach uh, good uh, good uh, professionals in uh, especially in uh, in journalism too. Melinda, I think it's uh, go ahead, Brian. Can I jump in? Yes, please. Really, I think the tragedy, the authorities are going to miss us uh, if Russia does a deeper invasion. The key post, besides putting the spotlight on domestic issues, has countered Kremlin propaganda and raised the world's understanding of Ukraine in the English language. And that is the global language. Uh, while I wish you know, the world would learn Ukrainian, the reality is that this is, this is still largely an e English speaking world. There are very few uh, of our voices. And we did that during the orange, uh, all the revolutions. We did that during the Euromaidan revolution. We knocked down that argument that this is a coup. US finance coup is bullshit because I'm sorry for the language, but we were there. We were there every single day of the revolution. We stayed our ground until the very, very end. And we didn't know how it was gonna turn out, but the keep post doesn't up and move to Prague or Vienna when the going gets tough. We told the truth about Ukraine to the world for a fraction of what the Kremlin is spending on propaganda in their global operations. And their global operations are English too, by the way. So I think we're gonna be missed. Uh, and that's why I really, really hope that a new voice, the Kiev Independent and other voices rise up from what the Kiev Post used to be. Brian, let me ask you one last question. Everyone wants to know what you're going to do next. Are you planning to stay in Kiev? Are you going to be in a supportive role? Are you going to be continuing to help build the next generation of journalists? What, what are your plans? Well, I need a break right now, so I'm going to take a break. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I really think this is dynamic. Things of the situation could change. I, I do plan to stay in Ukraine. It's my second home. I'm an American, but I've spent uh, many years here and don't intend to to relocate. So uh, we'll see uh, what happens. Right now, you know, I'm supporting uh, independent journalists and independent journalism in whatever way possible. Fabulous. Thank you all. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sev Gil. Thank you, Miroslava. Thank you, Yevgen. Thank you for everything that you do. Uh, you personally stick your necks out there. I, I have huge admiration for your work. Please keep Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sevgil. Thank you, Miroslava. Thank you, Yevgen. We admire what you do. Keep it up. Uh, keep us posted. Let us know how we can help. Brian, congratulations on your break. Uh, you have a week off uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for all, right, all that you've you. done in the service that you showed to Ukraine. Thank you for joining us today. Bye -bye. And until next thank time. Thank you to everyone. Th thank Bye -bye. you so much. Goodbye.